252 million years ago, the trajectory of life on Earth changed forever. An incredibly destructive event, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, wiped out 80-96% to of all marine species, and about 70% of terrestrial ones. The death and suffering that occurred at this time was on a scale that's truly difficult to imagine. Nothing quite like this has ever happened before or since, and it's arguably the closest that life on our planet has ever come to completely ending. The point at which this devastation occurred has been marked as the geologic boundary between the older Permian and the younger Triassic, the period in which the first dinosaurs appeared. This boundary is understandably a highly significant part of the rock record to study, and has so many implications for the evolutionary history of life. And in some parts of the world it's actually possible to see the Permian-Triassic boundary, preserved in the strata. A simple line that represents so much destruction now buried deep in the past. Well, during our adventures in South Africa, where we had been invited to join a paleontological expedition deep into the Karoo semi-desert by researchers at the University of the Witwatersrand, Doug and I actually got the chance to see this critical boundary for ourselves. Our journey had taken us to a small town called Oviston, right on the edge of the Eastern Cape. Nearby was Oviston Nature Reserve, and it was here that Ben and I would get to see the PT boundary with our own eyes. After the previous day's long journey from Johannesburg and through Clarence to see dinosaur footprints, everyone was tired but had very much appreciated the good night's sleep. Hey. The next morning, no. we awoke. No. But soon it was time for our fieldwork to begin. Leaving the place we were staying in Oviston, we walked a short distance and were greeted with some stunning views of the largest dam in South Africa. This is the Harep Dam, and it has the largest storage capacity of any dam in the country. It was on the shores of this remarkable man-made water body that our field work was to begin. After descending onto the beach and examining some of the geological structures of the area... And those little round um, features in the rock are actually gas bubbles that mm. couldn't escape because the, the magma was sort of trapped underground. We were then all split into our respective teams and began prospecting for fossils up the cliff. Doug and I, as members of Team Dinocephalian, followed Julian and began our fossil prospecting up one of the nearby cliffs, on a mission to find the first fossils of the expedition. Are you going to catch it? Is it a rock? Yeah. I'm not going to catch that. Why not? It'll hurt. No. We were told how best to go about locating fossils in this sort of environment, by looking for gullies in the slopes of the cliffs and hills, as this is where loose material, including fossils, that have weathered out from higher up will accumulate. Well, I've just been looking for fossils up and down these, this gully here. You can see all the, the rocks and the, the beds that the fossils are coming from, and um, just looking for loose bits of rock such as these, which are being weathered from, from the beds, falling down and occasionally, hopefully, contain some bone. Then, once some fragments have been spotted, you're, in theory, able to follow a trail of bone up the slope that leads you directly to where this material had come from. Go on. So, that's what we did. And, amazingly, it worked almost immediately. That's bone? Yeah. This it's in the pebble lag, so it's not very well preserved. But it's not a nice thank you. Right, so do that. Let's we'll see what else we have. Okay, cool. So just looking around at the rocks here, we found a tiny little bit of bone. Uh, this isn't attached to a full skeleton, unfortunately. Because um, you can see with all these pebbles and everything, this would have just been kind of washed away in a river. So it's a lot more loose than some of the other finds we might have. But it's still a bone, and bones are pretty cool. That's why we're here. And then Doug made the first exciting discovery of the expedition. Oh yeah, it's a skull. It's a skull. Can you see it? it? Looks like a skull. It's a skull. It looks like the big of the skull. If I do that, Doug, it's looking yeah, yeah. at you now. The eyes are here, the, the two canines are there, and the lower jaw, and the snout, this is the snout? The lower jaw V-shaped thing is there, and the back of the skull is here. So, 
it's not it's not very good you can see the left canine sticking out and then the lower jaw the chin that's the chin where the two uh, the, le the left and the right lower jaw meet right and there's the chin coming up two canines eyes oh, the top of back of the skull yeah that's the top the frontal and nasal and everything there and uh, that's it but this we we often get these v-shapes you see this this triangle is v that's the lower jaw that's a that's a that's a dead giveaway now, i know it's not easy but there's thin yeah thin lower jaw there the plate and the thin plate there and they meet with a v and it makes that like boat shaped chin that goes up like that you know and then definitely left canine and right canines orbits back of the skull so there he's looking at you can be uh, it's like that Dice, not know. as good as that other guy's skull and he's a bit squished diagonally you guys see that he's sideways sort of diagonally squished a bit yeah is another lystrosaurus then Lister. yeah because that's a very long yeah that's quite a long oh, snout and okay. um, you can see part of the left uh, sorry the right orbit orbital rim is still there you know yeah so um yeah but i know it's difficult but take the lower jaw and then match it to your own your own head so do you have to they have to tell everybody that they found something. Yeah, get on the radio. <laughs> and, um, just, just get on the radio, describe what you, what you found. This was an incredibly exciting find. Our first fossil of an animal called Lystrosaurus. Well, exciting to us anyway, but not so much to everyone else. Because Lystrosaurus was absolutely everywhere. As there was a time in the Earth's history where these beasts were apparently the most abundant terrestrial vertebrates in existence. Lystrosaurus is a kind of animal known as a dicynodont related to well-known creatures such as Placerius of Walking With Dinosaurs fame. They are not dinosaurs though, nor indeed reptiles at all, but instead part of that special synapsid lineage that we ourselves, as mammals, also belong to. Lystrosaurus was a pretty bizarre looking animal, with a semi-sprawling gait, two tusks projecting from its mouth, and a beak to help crop plant material. Amazingly, they lived during the late Permian period around 255 million years ago and endured the worst mass extinction in the history of life, the Great Dying, surviving into the early Triassic before finally succumbing to extinction about 250 million years ago. How on earth did these Dicynodonts manage to make it through this event? The end of the Permian was, to put it lightly, not a great time to be alive. And yet Lystrosaurus made it through and then seemingly thrived at the start of the following Triassic period, coming to dominate terrestrial ecosystems for a time. Well, that's the question we were soon going to investigate. After Doug's discovery, it wasn't long until more Lystrosaurus fossils were located, embedded in the sides of the cliffs. Here you have the orbit, and it's a Lystrosaurus. Like you can see the, the snout is going down here, this thing that's the tusk. So it's a very nice complete <laughs> skeleton going yeah. in the mountain. So the problem now is it's so badly located that we will never do anything with, with it. So yeah. we'll just glue it and cross our fingers that it's, it stays long enough uh, for one day maybe when we have the technical <laughs> capability of <laughs> taking it away. Dr. Benoit also gave us a lesson in the highly technical business of gluing fossils in the field. You unscrew it just a little bit. Mm -hmm. that so that you don't spill you don't spill it all yeah. in one <laughs> big sip, you see? You can spread it nicely. So the, the glue doesn't stick on the lid. It's gonna stick on the lid, but then you you take your geopic, your lid is going to be stuck, you take your geopic, you, bam, 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 oh. you break the paraloid, and then you can open it. Oh. So, after hopefully preserving the fossils for future expeditions to one day come and retrieve, and noting down the GPS coordinates, we made the risky descent back down the slopes. Good morning. We've made it. Good morning. Well, almost. And then back up them again. Oh, all right, thanks. <laughs> Oh, I'm not pulling you down, on me. Oh, good job. Thank you. So it had become clear that these were Triassic-aged rocks due to the sheer abundance of Lystrosaurus fossils being found here. Not only that, but the size of these Lystrosaurus skeletons themselves also offered a clue as to the time they came from. These Dicynodonts were notably smaller than the older Lystrosaurus species that lived before them. But why would that be? Well, we were about to find out. 
But to do that, we needed to go and see the moment that life on this planet changed forever, eternally frozen in rock. The Permian-Triassic boundary itself. We returned back to camp for lunch and soon set off again to go and get clearance for entering Oviston Nature Reserve, the land upon which it's possible to go and find the infamous boundary. The Nature Reserve is a beautiful area of land home to all kinds of wildlife, from ostriches to wildebeest, aardvarks and aardwolves. Despite not actually seeing these animals themselves while we were there, we did see evidence of the actions of these animals all over the place in the form of burrows. Someone's burrow. Likely created by aardvarks which will often dig these structures and then end up abandoning them. As well as the modern life that can be found in Oviston, there's also evidence of death at an unimaginable magnitude. The PT boundary, the site of the worst mass extinction event that ever happened in the history of life on Earth. Right here, under our feet. At this location within the nature reserve, there's a clear change in the stratigraphy of the rocks. This dramatic change from the lower, reddish-coloured sediment to the upper grey rock marks the point in deep time when the Permian came to an apocalyptic ending and gave way to the Triassic period. So why did this extinction happen in the first place? At the same time that the fossil record preserves evidence of a dramatic decrease in species diversity, there was a volcanic eruption taking place in what would one day become Siberia. These immense eruptions gave rise to a massive region of igneous rocks known as the Siberian Traps, as flood basalts poured over the land, releasing vast quantities of carbon dioxide and aerosols into the atmosphere. Combined with the combustion of coal triggered by these eruptions that rapidly released more CO2, this all had some disastrous consequences for life on Earth. The exact figures for the extent of death caused by this extinction do vary, but it's generally accepted that between 80 to 96% of species that inhabited the planet's seas were wiped from existence, while about 70% of terrestrial species disappeared. And this simple colour change in the rocks here is what marks this unimaginable destruction. Never before or since in the history of life has there been a time filled with so much death, and it was quite a feeling to be standing right on top of the record of this event. But it's not just the colour change of the rock here that indicates the presence of the PT boundary. In fact, the reason that the boundary was realised to even be visible here was due to the change in the Lystrosaurus species that are found on either side of it. Hey, Ben! Did you find anything? What's the bloody point in that? As we continued prospecting for Lystrosaurus specimens at this locality, we realised we were witnessing something called the Lilliput effect. Here's a skull of one of the smaller species of Lystrosaurus. Just down there, they're excavating the skull of a larger species. Now, the funny thing is that when you cross the permian triassic boundary, the species actually gets smaller, and that's the result of something called the Lilliput effect. As Julian explained to us, this is a phenomenon where organisms that survive an extinction event will display a notable decrease in overall body size after the event, due to various factors affecting their survival favouring a smaller size. This shrinking effect is seen in the fact that the larger Lystrosaurus macagi is restricted to the Permian period, while the much smaller Lystrosaurus murrayi and Lystrosaurus declivus are found living afterwards in the Triassic. So, when a student on a previous field trip spotted the skull of Lystrosaurus macagi in these sediments, it became apparent that the transition between periods must be recorded in the rocks right here. So, why did some of these Lystrosaurus species survive while others didn't? Well, there's a few different ideas. Presumably the larger species were occupying a different niche to the smaller ones. But there's actually an interesting study from a population of Lystrosaurus that lived in Antarctica that found evidence of prolonged stress in their tusks, indicating that perhaps these animals were undergoing periods of torpor, which is, would be the oldest example of torpor in the fossil record. So, were these animals perhaps more flexible in their physiology than was expected? However these animals survived, it seems that the smaller species that lived in the Triassic were well suited to this new world and flourished, dominating terrestrial ecosystems of the time. So that's a small Lystrosaurus, I guess, because there's no skull. Yeah. But I mean the most common thing here is Lystrosaurus. The, the, the small tail like that, it's not a cynodont or anything. Doug and I continued searching for the remains of these dicynodonts, while some of the team worked on excavating two skeletons of Lystrosaurus that had been located on the previous trip. Mm. 
I was lucky enough to find a few decent pieces and some blocks of rock. There's a few blocks with bone in. Not sure what. Mm. Yeah. What parts of the animal? The, the, the. Yeah, I see. I also came across a very nice humerus. While Doug and expedition member Dr. Mark Vandenbrandt managed to find a beautiful skull in situ. After noting down the grid reference, we moved to another part of the nature reserve closer to the entrance with another good outcrop. It wasn't long before we again managed to find some bone fragments, and expedition member Andrew located and recorded another in situ skull. Uh, it's either Lystrosaurus declivus or Marianne because of the size. It puts us in the Catberg formation. We'd experienced firsthand just how abundant Lystrosaurus got in the aftermath of the Permian extinction. These creatures' bones were literally everywhere in these formations, and the frequency with which we'd been finding their bones on just our first day really made us appreciate the success of Lystrosaurus. Returning back to camp that evening, we then had to make sure we catalogued all of the important fossil finds of the day. Recording the grid reference, the elevation and the formation that the fossils come from are all critical things to make note of giving context to these bones and allowing future researchers to come back and relocate the areas in which they originated. It's important too to record what particular bones are represented by each fossil, so that the preparators back at the university know what to look out for when working on them. After this documentation, the specimens were then carefully packed away, ready for transport when we were to leave. That evening, as we recovered from the day's excitement, we were lucky enough to be treated to Doug's musical talent as he attempted to play a very broken piano. Okay, so that's, 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 that's not out of tune, that's, everything's in the wrong place. Yep. Look, this, this is hitting more than one note. Well, it's hitting one, but it's just not... What do you want me to play? Uh, you know a bunch of Game of Thrones music, don't you? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, try that, it'd be funny. This is the Game of Thrones theme, right? <laughs> Most of these notes don't actually work, but this is going to be horrible. <laughs> Our first day of proper fieldwork in South Africa had been absolutely fantastic. We made some utterly amazing discoveries, literally just picking up Lystrosaurus bones wherever we went, and being able to stand on the Permian-Triassic boundary was yet another dream come true for me. To think about how much death and destruction this place represents is overwhelming. Nothing on this scale has ever been seen before or since, and the perseverance of the little Lystrosaurus in the face of so much carnage really does have to be admired. We felt so lucky to once again be witnessing such a significant part of South Africa's paleontological heritage. Join us in the next episode as our fieldwork continues. This time, we're on the hunt for an ancient relative of ours that might have had a venomous bite, the amazing Euchamberzia. Follow our search as we attempt to rediscover where this animal originally came from, get separated from the group in the process, and make some more remarkable fossil finds. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new, and I really hope you're enjoying our South African adventures so far. A huge thank you once again to everyone who donated and made this trip possible, allowing Doug and I, as well as students of Wits University, to get this experience doing paleontological fieldwork.